Yeah, good evening all and thanks for coming to our second lecture of the 2019-2020 of the series of the Michael Crowley Lecture Series. And before I introduce our guest speaker, which tonight's going to be a, an exciting presentation for us because there's a, as you can imagine, a lot of local interest in this particular presentation. I want to tell you about a couple of the upcoming events. On Monday, 4 November, we have a triumvirate of uh, Shea Afsai, uh, Dr. Sean O'Loughlin, and Dr. John Quinn from Salve Regina that are going to discuss Ireland's Jewish community and Newport's Jewish rabbi, Rabbi Peter Lewis. Uh, so that, sorry, mark your calendars for that. Monday, 4 November, I encourage you to sign up early, as usual. Friday, 15 November. Ireland's happy man, and if you saw him last time, you know what I'm talking about. And that's Cale Dunn. And Cale Dunn is a musician, a singer, a songwriter, uh, an entertainer extraordinaire, and he rocks the walls. Now that one is going to be at Salve Regina University and Tone Center. Uh, we will have catered uh, beverages and uh, appetizers. The cost is $20. It is not a money maker. Uh, Matter of fact, we'll probably do well to break even there, but I would like you to all come so that we can remain solvent here. Okay. Please, and, uh, it'll be it'll really be a fun night. I'd like to introduce a couple of the Hibernian officers that are here tonight. And first, uh, Father Francis O'Loughlin, the very Reverend Francis O'Loughlin, second grade father. Island know he's the pastor of Jesus Savior. He is a chaplain to so many organizations and to include the Ancient Order of Hibernians and he was the Hibernian of the Year this year, 2019. Great to have you with us. Tonight. In the back of the room I have Kathleen Kiki Finn, the president of the Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernians. Just for the benefit of the audience and Father, can I have all the Hibernians stand up? I'd just like to see how many we've got in the room here. That's great. Yeah. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Father Robert Heyman, who was last with us in 2014. Father is a native of Pawtucket. He's the pastor emeritus of St. Sebastian's Church in East Providence. Providence. He was ordained in Louvain, Belgium, and he's a self-described lifelong passion for history. He earned his master's and his doctorate of philosophy and history from Salary, uh, excuse me, from Providence College where he taught for 30 some odd years as a professor of history. He serves as the historian of the diocese and he's authored two books on the Providence diocese history. He's also passionate about skiing, swimming, and sailing. So you don't sit still very long, Father. <laughs> A warm Newport welcome. For its existence, the ancient order of Hibernians was a secret society. And just to like ease any tension or suspicion, I would remind you the only one that did not take the oath of secrecy in the ancient order of Hibernians was the chaplain. <laughs> so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> Like every immigrant group that came to the United States in the prior to the 1920s, the Catholic Irish brought with them a tradition of taking care of their own, caring for their own. The American version of the ancient order of Hibernians, and it's certainly distinct from the Irish version, was organized as a benevolent society in New York in 1836. Uh, it would do charity, but it's a benevolent society. 
and for a society dedicated to taking care of its own. One of the most human of actions, once written in our DNA, is that we bury our dead. And we do so with religious overtones. Mankind has done this for 20,000 years. If you remember when the Irish came, they came mostly as single individuals, at least in the, initial, in the early years. Uh, brothers might have come together, brother and sister, cousins, people from the same village. It was only a minority that came as family groups. So when they came to the United States, the average age of the death for an Irish immigrant in the 19th century was 14 years. So one of the realities that we're going to have to face is death. And so they worry. Having left their families behind in Ireland, who would bury them? Who would say prayers at their grave? Because that's what the Christian firm of funeral men saying prayers at the grave. All right, so in 1836, New York, the St. Patrick's Fraternal Society was established. It was also known as the St. Patrick Burial Society. And the idea was to ensure that they would have a Christian funeral. And there were people at their morning who would mourn for them and bury them with dignity. The, a, after establishing their society, the members of the society, in conjunction with others in Pennsylvania, wrote to the ancient order of Hibernians in Ireland and secured their permission to use the name Ancient Order of Hibernians. Now, there were these benevolent societies all over the place, and this was just one of them. It would become the largest of the ethnic burial societies, or one of the largest in the United States. For example, uh, up near Winsaka, there was the Shamrock Society. It was basically an ancient order of Hibernian society, but they wouldn't want to use the name because it wasn't very popular and very wasn't respected at the time. The model of the Hibernians was and is friendship, unity, and true Christian charity. Unlike the Hibernians in Ireland, the American Hibernians undertook, as they say, to protect each other in things lawful and not otherwise. <laughs> All right. The society then is founded in order to bury the dead. Very soon, there was added to it the other responsibility that families have had since time immemorial to care for the sick, care for those who are unable to care for themselves. It is in 1849 that a Patrick Kiernan, a province laborer who lived on Plain Street in Providence. If you've ever been to Rhode Island Hospital, You've been to Plain Street, right in the middle there. He would gather together a group of Irishmen in his home, and they would form a burial society. All right? The ancient order of Hibernians Benevolent, Sick, and Burial Society. That was its legal name, its proper name. All right? I will refer to it as Hibernian Benevolent Society just to keep things short. According to the rules of the St. Patrick's Fraternal Society and of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, um, one became a member of the society if one was born in Ireland, of Irish parents, of course. Um, if one uh, was over 18 and under 40, if one had the $3 initial initiation fee, if one had the 35 to 50 cents, uh, which you paid monthly as your annual duels, 
uh, and if you were willing to take an oath of secrecy. Why that? Well, it is because in 1738, Pope Clement XII had issued a papal bull in which he forbade all Catholic faithful from joining or assisting the Freemasons or any other secret society. Now, we all know the Irish are terrible about keeping secrets. <laughs> but it was the custom in the 1830s for Americans to form secret societies. It gave them a certain prestige. If you were the president of your society, you somehow stood out in a community where you were not known as you would if in your native place or your native village. All right, so secret societies were common in the United States. Uh, and so it was not uncommon that the ancient order of Hibernians asked their members not to discuss their internal affairs. As I say, the only one exempt from this obligation was the Catholic chaplain. According to the articles of the Orders Constitution, which was adopted in 1871, when the organization was incorporated as a, uh, a federal organization, uh, one, one had to be, as they say, under 20 years of age, or over 40, or over, one had to be over 20 years and under 40. One had to be able to pay the uh, monthly dues, which were collected, of course, at the end of the year when you had your annual election for offices, people were paid by the month, not by the week. You have to wait till the 1880s for that to change. All right, and so at the end of the year, you were required to pay your monthly dues, all of it. And if you didn't pay, you were dropped. All right. For your monthly dues, if you were sick, a member, a member of the society, if you, were, if you died, you were given $50 to cover the burial costs. If your wife died, you were given $5. <laughs> Why the difference? Why? The words, Irish wake. <laughs> uh, difference in expense. All right. If you became incapa incapacitated and accidents the workplace were frequent, and the Irish were doing some of the more difficult jobs. You were given five dollars a week, all right, which was more than enough to sustain yourself for six months. Either in six months you were healthy or dead. <laughs> but think of it: who was there to help the Irish immigrant? Who was there to bury the dead? Who was there to care for them in their, in their sickness or after accidents? The families were in Ireland. So this is an organization formed to care for their own. And although the Irish were not well respected, at least by their Rhode Island neighbors, they were respected in this. They cared for their own. The first thing we hear, if you will, about the ancient order of Hibernians uh, after its founding in 18, uh, 1849, uh, this may be one of the things we don't hear. In 1855, a political rally was held outside of this building, which happens to be the Sisters of Mercy's convent on Broad Street in Providence. It was a know-nothing gathering. Right. And the word was out uh, that when this, this gathering was to be, and several hundred Irishmen left <coughs> the mills in Oldieville and gathered in the uh, courtyard in back of this building we're looking at here in order to protect the nuns so that nothing happened to them similar to what happened to the convent in Charleston, Massachusetts. We don't know whether the members of the ancient order of Hibernians 
were among that group of several hundred Irishmen that attended and were present to protect the nuns, but in all probability, they were. It was only after the Know Nothing movement began to wane in 1857 that the members of the ancient order of librarians uh, engaged in their first St. Patrick's Day parade. Some 400 or so of them. Uh, this is a rather out of focus uh, picture of the parade in New York City. All right? They would parade with their banners. They would be dressed in their broad black blood cloth suits wearing their derby hats. And they made a decidedly positive impression upon the people of Providence. 1858, St. Patrick's Day fell on a Sunday, so you don't parade. All right? After that, they paraded in Taunton Mass. So this is the, the first manifestation of it, and the last until we'll see in 1870. <coughs> One of the lectures, the lecture we heard last week was about the, the Finians. All right? In the 1860s, the Finians began to organize. There's a large group of them here in Newport. And many who joined the Finians with their aim of a violent freeing of Ireland from the uh, grasp of the British were members of the Ancient Order of Hibernians. And so for a period of time, the Ancient Order of Hibernians was in somewhat disarray. Here in uh, Providence, uh, a member of the uh, Providence group, the Providence Hibernian Society, uh, attended the uh, National Convention, if you will, of the Ancient Order of Hibernians in New York in 1857. And in that same year, one of the Providence leaders by the name of uh, Peter uh, Sinnott would write to the national organization and complain that the national organization was engaging in politics. We don't know what he meant. Right? The national organization has very few in the way of archives. The particular letter comes from the Irish world, an Irish newspaper in New York. All right? Basically what the New York group says, Senate, who was a Finian before there was a Finians, we don't know who you are. So we don't put any stock into your complaints. Goodbye. If someone in Providence wants to form a, an ancient order of Hibernian group, we'll help them. But the Finian's organizations begin to grow, the Civil War comes on, and nothing much happens. All right? We lose contact with, with the New York group. And the New York group is in disarray at this particular point. Uh, By 1870, things have settled down. Right? The 1870s see the Irish begin to come into their own. Not only politically, the first uh, councilmen are elected to say in the city of Providence, uh, we have a budding Irish middle class and an Irish social class, if you will. The, a group of 10 members of the Ancient Order of Hibernians in Providence complained about the membership of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, that they were engaged, they were controlled by a Roman element. Why, you know, here you one group is concerning another. What's the problem with the Roman element being controlled uh, with uh, an Irish group? Well, it's the 1870s. What's happening in the 1870s? We have a revival of the temperance movement. And the bishops, both McFarland, who was the bishop of Hartford, who lived in Providence, and Hendricken, the strong temperance man. And so the idea is to embarrass the uh, membership lead, uh, leaders uh, by accusing them of being part of the rum element. All right? I have a
collection of obituaries of maybe 20 Hibernians spanning the 1880s to the 1920s. A third of them were engaged in liquor business. <laughs> All right? If you were an enterprising Irishman and you wanted to rise economically, liquor business was the way to do it. Of course, in the 1850s, the, the newly constructed uh, prison in Providence, where the mall now is, uh, half its immigrants, half its uh, and, uh, people in there uh, were Irishmen. All right? So thank you, Pitt. The Irish, the Irish were great for, for liquor. Uh, the group that was that was complained about the leadership was expelled. All right? They weren't expelled because they didn't pay their dues. They were expelled because they complained about the liquor element. And Peter Sinnott, that great Finian, he was one of the leaders. The first mayor of Providence uh, elected after the Know Nothing period was James Y. Smith. And James Y. Smith became mayor of Providence in 1857 because he promised not to enforce the liquor laws. <laughs> and he was supported by Sinnott and that group that was involved with the liquor trade. All right? The other thing that was, what happened was the, um, the group that was expelled would form a group called the Knights of St. Patrick. Now the Knights of St. Patrick had an elaborate uh, regalia, regalia if you will, uh, and they rode horses in the St. Patrick's Day's Parade. Right, so they had to have at least the means to rent, if not own the horses. You might know about the, the Knights of St. Patrick because there was an organization here in, Brock, in Newport. They would march, first year they rode on their horses in the St. Patrick's Day Parade, the second year they rode in carriages. Take your bet. All right? The liquor element, all right? The other objection that the, uh, the older ancient order of Iberians group had against the new guys is that they only, not only formed a Knights of St. Patrick group, but they also formed an ancient order of Hibernian group associated with the New York office. All right? It's called the Knights of St. Patrick. The, uh, the ad in the newspaper is the Knights of St. Patrick Ancient Order of Hibernians. And what that announcement announced was that they were going, the ancient order of Hibernians were going to hold a dance. What's the problem with the dance? You're looking at it. It would get out of hand. All right? In Ireland, the priest went around and, and to end the, the custom of dancing on a crossroads. All right? But dances are very important for the Irish. Because you met your spouse at church, all right, hopefully after mass, not during, <laughs> or at the church function, or at a dance. So the ancient order of Hibernians, in that fledgling group, organized a dance. Now, dances uh, for, uh, held, uh, organized by church groups, church societies, for pious purposes, were written by the church. All right. So again, you accuse your leaders in the, of the older ancient order of Hibernian group, the Hibernian Orphan uh, Society, uh, of b being drunks and rivalers. Okay. The whole idea is to embarrass one another. Uh, but the ancient order of Hibernians, as they say, uh, the Society uh, were, were basically rivals of each other. The new society, all right, they grew up beginning in 1871. The ones associated with the New York Society, all right, they, like the, the older society, would appeal for a charter from the state, charter of incorporation. 
The early society had done so in 1857, but they couldn't get past the Kinte Charter, couldn't get past the, the, the House of Representatives. Because the House of Representatives in 1857, which were, were at the cusp of the Know Nothing period, uh, said, we don't need any more secret societies. All right? Secret societies are out. I know we've done good work. You know how you've taken care of your own. But we don't need any more secret societies. What they were afraid of is that old uh, myth, if you will. Why did the Irish come to the United States? They were sent by the Pope. All right, to take over the country, to make up for the loss in the Reformation. Why were the Germans coming? Harry Beecher, plead for the West. All right, why were they flooding into the Midwest? They were sent by the Pope. Okay, that's the Irish plot. And it goes on to 1920. There was a man, a man by the name of Katz who ran for governor in Florida in 1920. He told people about the Pope's plan to build a tunnel from the Vatican to the Palm Beach. <laughs> and he got elected. Okay. As I said, the 1870s are a time when the Irish come into their own. They enter into the middle class. All right, you might recognize the people here. Uh, Ellen Maha and Michael McCormick, Jr. Michael McCormick, Sr. was one of the leading uh, contractors in, here in Newport. All right? And you can see that this is, this is middle class America. Uh, second and third generation of Irish Americans. Again, I think these are the McCormick's, although there was no no. Uh, name on the particular photograph when I was like, as I saw it. <laughs> Given that the resources available to the Irish in the 1870s, we would see eight uh, new, uh, in total, eight ancient order of Hibernians, benevolent, uh, sick, and burial societies formed. Eight. All right? That's the original plus seven. The new uh, New York-based societies, there would be 20, all right, within four years. 20, okay? Now, the ancient order of Iberian sick benefit society, when the new society, the New York society base, appealed for a charter, they submitted a counter-petition, saying, you're not, we're not, we're not willing to give up the name Hibernian or Celtic. So the Rhode Island legislature had to have a conference where they debated whether or not Celtic and Hibernian were names that could be exclusive to one organization or the other. All right? And they finally decided to allow the new group, the New York group, New York based group, to have the name Ancient Order of Hibernians of the United States. All right? You had to make the distinction. You had the Iberian Benevolent Society, and you had the Ancient Order of Ibernians of the United States. All right? And they, the, the new society was the one that grew the fastest. But there are certain problems. As the new society grew, someone had the audacity uh, to ask Bishop Henrikin, can you be a member of the ancient order of Hibernians with its oath of, of secrecy, both groups had it, and still be a Catholic in good standing? All right. And Hendricks, Hendricks' response was no. You have to choose. All right. Now, unlike bishops in other places, Henry didn't, didn't pursue this. But in other dioceses, the, the bishops did. Uh, it's true that in uh, Stoning to Connecticut, the pastor there, uh, because of some local problems they had with the Hibernians, would allow them in his church. In Providence, for the most part, 
the pastors would not allow ancient order of Hiberians to, to wear their regalia when they attended the funeral. All right, the ribbons in their pockets or their across their chest they weren't allowed to wear them. All right, they were never aware, allowed to wear their regalia when they went to mass on St. Patrick's Day because they were not an organization approved by the church. Okay. So that, I think, would retard the membership, but apparently did not. The I'm trouble reading my own stuff. All right. Um, one of the problems that the ancient Lord of Hyperns would have was a group called the Molly Maguires. All right. Word spread through the country of the violence associated with the Molly Maguires, who were members of the ancient order of Hibernians, all right? Who did everything lawful but not otherwise? Well, they did both. And so the prestige, the, uh, pro the propaganda around the Molly Maguires would be a detriment to the growth of the ancient order of Hibernians. So would Jeremiah O'Donovan's. Um, his, or his um, dynamite campaign that took place in Ireland, England, and Canada. All right? Uh, so the O'Donovan Rosa. Rosa. Uh, so that further in, impacted the popularity of the ancient order of Hibernians. But I think what really was the problem that would inhibit the growth of the ancient order of Hibernians. In 1884, after having said that the, uh, the both societies, both the older and the new societies, were in flourishing condition, and, well, in 1886, they were put there appeared in the Providence Journal on short notice that no benevolent society in the city was able to function. They had all disbanded, or they all had ceased to, to work and run out of money. What happened? All right? You live in Newport? <coughs> Why was this built? It was built to keep down the urban mob. 1873. Remember what happened? The beginning of the Long Depression. It used to be called the Great Depression until we had a Great Depression. The beginning of the Long Depression. All right. Uh, many businesses failed, and thus many of the visitors to to Newport lost their saving, life savings as the, the various the companies in which they own stock collapsed. All right? So Newport economies in 1873 began to go into the tubes. <coughs> the, the problem was if you don't have a job and no prospect of a job then you have to move or you have to go on charity. And the ancient order of life earnings basically um, exhausted their resources. And all the eight of the older uh, Iberian benevolent society, they all collapsed. And ten of the new societies also collapsed. Now, the trouble with the ancient order of life earnings uh, <coughs> national office is they lack a good historian. They've got a lot of people who do chronology. They don't have a lot of people who do history. Chronology tells you who, what, when. History tells you why. So the question is, why is it that nine of the 20 or so societies, one collapsed and was reformed, but nine of the new societies survived and all the others collapsed? Right? 
Bernard Doyle. These, uh, let me cite him as typical of members of the ancient order of librarians. Came to the United States about 1859 or so, eight, maybe 1860. Got a job in a textile mill in Providence, all right? Uh, as did many Irish, the mill employed 300 Irishmen. In 1865, he left the, the mill and became a Providence policeman, all right? Thomas Doyle, mayor of Providence, regularly recruited strong Irishmen. You do not want to be a Providence policeman in the 1880s. There's no radios, all right? You walk the beat, and you're all alone, all right? And you had a lot of drunken Irishmen out there. All right, so they recruited the strongest, the tallest, the biggest Irishman they could find. Well, that was one of them. But he was only a province policeman uh, for about three years. Then he left to enter into the liquor business. <laughs> What's new? All right? And then he left that and became a salesman for the J.B. Barnaby Company. J.B. Barnaby was a a uh, clothing merchant, had one of the largest department stores in Providence, all right? So does this mean? Doyle, like many other members of the ancient order of librarians, Doyle would be the, one of the early presidents of uh, Division Three in Providence. He would grow to be a state officer, he would become the national treasurer of the ancient order of librarians. Every time he left one occupation for the next, he improved himself financially. Every time. All right? The reality was that there was enough Irishmen born in Ireland, came to the United States, who had proved themselves financially to support those nine divisions that continued in existence throughout the Great Depression, the Long Depression. 1873 to 1893. All right. So those divisions that did survive survived because of the well-being and the success of their Irish members. All right. Now if I could read this from the light, I'd be doing really well. In any case. All right. Uh, the ancient order of librarians would be under suspicion until the 1890s. The American archbishops would gather at the Council of Baltimore, and they would discuss whether or not the ancient order of librarians should be condemned, because it was a secret society, thus against the Pope. But most of them, like Hemrigan and others of Irish background, did not want to force the Irishmen to choose between their faith and their nationality. For the most part, they said nothing. When Rome condemned the ancient order of Liburnians, the Archbishop of Baltimore, Cardinal James Gibbons, went to Rome to persuade the Pope not to, for permission not to publish the condemnation in the United States. So it was not until the 1880s, really, that one, if one was a member of the ancient old librarians, one could attend a funeral of a brother or attend Mass on St. Patrick's Day wearing your regalia. All right? It took that long for the ancient order of librarians to be accepted. One of the stated aims of the ancient librarians today, as then, was to celebrate their their loyalty to Ireland. How do you do it? You do it primarily by, if you will, marching on St. Patrick's Day. Okay? So you march on St. Patrick's Day. If you recall, the first group that ever marched on St. Patrick's Day were, of course, done in the lovely city of Pawtucket. That was in 1837 when the Father Matthew Benevolent Society, uh, or a temperance society, 
march behind the Coronet Band through the lovely streets of Pawtucket. The next year they got on a train after having marched through Pawtucket and they came and marched through the streets of Providence before returning to Pawtucket for the, the, the meal that follows the traditional St. Patrick's Day. All right? So I say the, the ancient Ohio Viburnians marched for the first time in 1857. They made a great impression, but they did, it wasn't a continued thing. The Civil War would intervene and all the rest. In New York, the ancient order of Hibernians were the ones that organized the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Not so Rhode Island. In Rhode Island, a coalition of various Irish societies would meet in January and they would begin making plans. Do we march or not? If we march, who's going to be the Grand Marshal? So in 1871, we have the three of the Ancient Order of Viburnians organizations, three of the only group, they marched. In 1872, we have the three older groups plus the one of the New York organization. 1876. What's they famous for? The Centennial. All right. In 1876, we had eight of the old groups marching and we had 12 of the new ones, all right? So they were coming to their own, even in spite of the depression that had settled on, on, on the country. By the 1880s, now we, we've talked about how the organization uh, was not doing too well in terms of publicity, all right? It wasn't doing too well in passing down to the young generation, the next generation, a love of Ireland. Well, that's why the Irish marched on St. Patrick's Day. To express their love of Ireland, all right? And being Irish, they marched to express their love of Ireland and their hatred for the British. <laughs> to one hand and hand. Okay, so and by the 1880s, we have an issue that the young are not willing to march, all right? Are not anxious to march. So in Cleveland, in 1884, the ancient order of librarians made a very important, and for some, a very difficult decision. What's the requirement to become a member of the ancient order of librarians? You have to be born in Ireland. All right? We're running out of people born in Ireland. So many of the divisions, at least some of the divisions, had begun allowing the sons of, of people born in Ireland to become members. And Cleveland in 1984, they made that official policy, right? If your parents were Irish, and like your parents, you had to be, a, be able to pay the dues, you had to be a practical Catholic, all right? You all know what a practical Catholic is? One who makes their Easter duty. You know what the Easter duty is? It means you have to go to communion sometime during Easter day, between you know, Ash Wednesday and uh, Trinity Sunday. If you can't do that, you have to go to confession. Okay? So you have to be a practical Catholic, all the rest. In 1884, if you were the son of an Irishman or an Irish woman, you could now join the ancient order of librarians. Alright? Big chance. The difficulty was, the younger generation wasn't terribly interested. Alright? Now, it's not at all unusual in every ethnic group you can, you can look at. First generation, strong Irishman. Second generation, strong Irishman. Third generation, ah. Fourth generation, don't bother me. <laughs> All right? So how do you get the young people interested in joining the ancient order of Hyperians and marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade? Right? 1884, there are only 285 members of the ancient order of Hyperians. Granted, we've got down, we're down to uh, 10 or 11 societies, 285 marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade province. Okay? Bishop Robbins, Bishop Harkin said, if it wasn't for the Irish military units, it would have been a disgrace. So how do you get the young Irishmen to march? Well, you get the young Irishmen to watch 
uh, by forming the Hibernian Rifles. All right, the Hibernian Rifles. Now, I don't, I don't know the reason for it, but there was a great popularity in various ethnic groups forming military organizations. Right? Everyone did it. The Italians have their, their, their Italian regiment. Right? The French Canadians have their God. Right? The Portuguese have theirs. All right? The Irish have theirs. Okay. So, a member of the Rhode Island militia uh, went to the governor of uh, the state by the name of Brown and persuaded him to authorize or to grant charters to two companies of Hibernian rifles in about 1880, 1886. Uh, one in one province, one in one Okay, and that's how they began. Two companies of rifles. This is obvious from the newspaper. If you, if I had put up a picture of the uh, National Guard or militia at that time marching. They will look a lot crisper than this group does. <laughs> All right. All right. So they were given permission to organize. And again, before this is done by the, and the National Organization allowed this, the early 1880s. Now, probably groups like this before the National Organization agreed to to incorporate them. All right. You uh, you drilled like the the, the, the military, the militia. You did you engaged in field exercises like the militia. But you then, when there was a, a say the land league speaker come in, the province, then the ancient the Iberian ancient the Iberian rifles formed the military honor guard that escorted them from the place hotel to the place where they spoke. They formed a guard around the speaker's platform, all right? All right, so uh, this, is, uh, in order to, this is in order to get the, the young people uh, interested in joining all of this. At the end of the 1890s, uh, most, or all Catholic organizations had their degrees. You still see today uh, the The uh, oh, senility is creeping in. What can I tell you? <laughs> the Knights of Columbus. All right, they walk around carrying swords. Okay. All, all the organizations has these groups. So with the H Order of Hibernians. These are the Hibernian Knights and a province parade in 1820. If you happen to go on the internet and the lurching Hibernians, and you see uh, Hibernian swords. Okay, for sale. Well, look what they're carrying. All right, they're carrying swords. The knights, the knights of Saint Patrick, carry pistols. All right. Uh, the Highbury rifles, rifles. All right. And these guys carry swords, but they look good. They look good. These are green uniforms, black helmets. Uh, red, uh, no, green and white uh, feathers, feathers in the helmets, all right? They look good. Now, uh, this is the way you get people to march at this particular time. By the 1890s, the St. Matthew State Parade basically consisted of military units, all right? You get some of the divisions marching as well, but basically they consisted of military, military units, Irish military units, all right? The second regiment, Rhode Island National Guard, was almost a completely Irish group. And then you had the, the Hibernian Rifles, and you had the Young Islanders, all right, which is the Clonagall group, and you had the the Guard of the Irish Foresters. They parade, they participated in the parade, and they made it something that people went out and watched. All right. Another of the aims of the Hibernians was that they were to support the Irish desire for freedom. 
<coughs> Ancient Order of Librarians was formed what? As a benevolent organization. It made a point of not involving itself in politics. Okay? Yet, individual members of the Ancient Order of Librarians uh, flocked to hear uh, Charles Stuart Parnell, his, his sister, his mother came, all right, and they, they were well received. And many members of the Parliamentary Party from Ireland came here, and they received welcome. You know? the, the distinction being escorted by the Liberian rivals, all the rest. But the ancient order of Liberians itself, because of its difficulties, uh, because uh, of the violence associated with it in the past, wanted nothing to do with the violence associated with Irish independence. And so they separated. Okay? They would keep themselves out of uh, politics. <coughs> now, the ancient order of the ancient order of Hibernians had been reconciled in 1898. The two groups, all right? The Board of America, Board of Erin, had been reunited in 1898. But in 1906, there's another split because groups were formed here in Rhode Island and elsewhere whose aim was to support the Irish independence movement. All right? By whatever means, violence or parliamentary. Did you ever go on the, the Google, the, uh, the Hibernian Knights? Try it sometime. The only response we'll get is the Hibernian Knights or the Hibernian Rifles in Ireland. Somehow or other, the national organization knows nothing about the Hibernian Rifles. <laughs> can't, I can't explain that. But I've, I've emailed them many times, and they, they ignore me. <laughs> uh, but in 1906, groups are formed, divisions are formed, of groups that will and do take a public stand in favor of Irish independence. All right? So we have another split in the organization that lasts in, until about 1931, when the last of them will be accepted as part of the, the same organization. All right? Now, what I have not done is talk about the Lady Hibernians. And I would be remiss if I did not. All right. Women became involved in the public sphere in the early 1900s, near the 1800s. They were the backbone of the anti-slavery movement. In the 1850s, when Rhode Islanders, the Irish in Rhode Island, were pushing for the right to vote on the same level as native-born Americans, women were in Rhode Island doing the same. 1886, the Irishmen got the vote. The women did not. All right? But women would play an important part in any organization, particularly also the ancient order of Hibernians. Yes, true. In the early groups, particularly the 1870 groups that formed the new groups, they sold the Irish flag, they sold the American flag that the groups carry. All right? They're all right there. The organizations would have socials. It wasn't the guys that organized the socials. The socials were dancers that were very important in the sociability of the organization. Um, one, of the, one of the things that would happen, they said the, the, a lot of people would get tired of marching. Any account of St. Patrick's Day, all right, and that's how the newspaper generally begins, as usual, the weather was terrible. <laughs> So who wants to march in the rain and the snow? All right. Who care? Who clears the city streets in Newport? Nobody. <laughs> if you're going to march in Newport, all right, in the 1870s, then you march in the snow, in the slush. By the way. Newport began celebrating St. Patrick's Day in 1863, all right? It ended in 1877 because the pastor of St. Mary's, Philip, Philip Grace, 
like the pastors elsewhere, said, why are we spending money, uh, uh, why are we losing a day's pay by taking the day off to march? And why are we spending money feeding these, uh, paying for the bands and feeding these groups that comes in to march when we should be taking care of the poor? So St. Patrick's Day parades in Newport, for the most part, that have been the regulars since 1863, ended in 1877. Now, that doesn't mean we didn't have parades in Newport after that. What would happen, because less people were interested in parading in St. Patrick's Day, they stay organized unified parades. So they had one in Providence, one year, next year in Pawtucket, next year in Woonsocket, the next year maybe in, in uh, Newport. Right. But it ends, the tradition of parading on St. Patrick's Day in Newport basically ends in 1877. Uh, let me back to the women where I was, where I was going. All right, the women did much, much to aid the organization. But it wasn't until 1895 that the national organization would recognize a ladies' auxiliary. Again, like the young men joining uh, uh, the organization uh, who weren't born on the island, some of the divisions were accepting them, some divisions had organizations of women before 1895. 1897, the first Rhode Island group was formed. All right? Okay. What we're looking at is Mary Ellen Jolly. Remember her? She was president of the Ladies' Auxiliary in Providence, in the Rhode Island, in Pawtucket, like all great things happen in Pawtucket. Uh, is that thing where I'm from? She was president of the, uh, the organization here in, uh, in Pawtucket. She became uh, a member, a, a leader in the state organization. All right. She organized one of the first celebrations of St. Peter's Day. All right. Uh, she'd be going on to be the national president of the ancient order of white burnings ladies and gentlemen. Her big thing, you know, nuns of the battlefield monument in Washington, D.C. She wrote a book, Nuns of the Battlefield. And she uh, pushed this, the Congress to allow, to allow a monument to be erected on the, in, in Washington to the nuns who served on the battlefields of the Civil War. Right. Uh, when the men began to lose interest in the ancient order of Ibernians, at least lose their enthusiasm for the thing Irish, the women picked it up. All right. Among the things that they would do uh, is they would push for the teaching of Irish history in the public schools. It was distorted because the history books they taught from were written by Englishmen. <laughs> so they wanted some more balanced. All right? The best they were able to do is get the uh, Catholic schools to teach Irish history. And they offered scholarship, they offered prizes for the best Irish essay among the Catholic school students. Right? So she and her husband, uh, who was a councilman in Providence, would push these kinds of agendas. All right. The ancient order of librarians, last, the last major, whoops, that says somewhere. Okay, that doesn't work. Uh, the last major parade on St. Patrick's Day in Providence in the, in the 1920s. Actually, it was 1919. All right? We, the Irish did not march by military unit, or did they not march by Iberian division? They marched by parish. Right. One parish alone, Assumption Parish in Province, turned out a thousand men, men, a lot of them, all right? All right? And they marched for Irish self determination. That's the last major ethnic parade in Providence before it would resume in the 1960s. Alright, if you did march in St. Patrick's Day, what did you do? 
well, you went to a lecture or you went to a concert, and this basically was a money-raising event that you would use uh, to, for your charitable organizations. <coughs> Beginning in 1892, I think, uh, they began the habit of holding a formal dinner on St. Patrick's Day. Right? The initial group would be the St. Patrick's Society. And they were the, they, you, know, you see fancy dinners, they wore all that kind of stuff. Then in 1901, we had the first we had an organization, a much more egalitarian group, called the Friendly Sons. Let me emphasize sons. Friendly Sons of St. Patrick. All right? Uh, again, formal dinner. All right? Begins in Providence, has a group here in Newport, all the rest. 1907, you have a group that organized that was very, very radical for its time. Not only did they invite their members to sit down for dinner on St. Patrick's Day, they also invited their wives. <laughs> so that's what you did on St. Patrick's Day. You, maybe you celebrated with your friends, uh, your husband went out for a dinner uh, that night, and the wife stayed home and celebrated with her friends at home. All right? Except for the few that went out. All right. Uh, I've gone for an hour. Oh, 50, 60 minutes. That's normal for me. Short sermons, long talks. <laughs> I'd be happy to entertain any questions if there are any. Yes. Well, how ancient were the ancient Hibernians in Ireland? Where did that go back to? There's work by Thomas O'Day, three volumes, all right? And he'll answer all your questions. <laughs> Chronology. It goes back to the 1500s, I say. Oh, well, thereabouts. All right. And basically, they're trying to protect their own against the bridge. Right. Uh, but he's the he's the expert on the Irish ancient Irish libraries. They know they're known by many names. Riverman, for example, is another name. All right. Uh, but as long, as long as we have the British, we have Riverman. <laughs> Yes. When did they? Yes. When did they? What? Uh, in the 1890s. They finally recognized them. Okay. The Union of Saint John Baptiste, which we have here in the socket, they didn't recognize the women until 1905. So the Irish were a little bit ahead. In the 1890s. 1897 is when the first groups organized in Rhode Island. And they spread quickly. All right. Okay. Anyone else? Should I bore everybody? No. Uh, my sister would say the ladies were in. No, 1894, um, they're celebrating their 125th anniversary this year. 1891, I have the date right, but I'm not going to read it. 125th anniversary this year. 125th. They kept the movement alive. Yes, man. Uh, question about the whole secret society thing. From my youth, I've heard that the Catholic Church doesn't support membership in the secret societies, and the Masons were the prime That's example. Right. It wasn't until more recently that I realized the Hibernians, there's some element of that, because my husband to <coughs> say what happens at meetings. But can you explain what, what the Church's stance on that is and why? So Basically, the Church uh, in the 1730s uh, was concerned about the Masons. Now, not the medieval masons, the modern masons, all right? And they were a rational group, political group, that worked to undermine the French monarchy. All right, so we have the collapse of the, uh, the French monarchy as a result of, part of, partially because of the work of the masons. So they were thought to be a threat not only to the uh, state, but also to the church, because the church suffers under the French monarchy. 
under the uh, French Revolution. All right. Uh, so any group that would threat, threat, uh, pose a danger to church or state was condemned by the church. Now, if you were a member of the ancient Albertians, when the question was asked of Henrikin, Henrikin would say, "All right, you shouldn't belong, but if you want to retain your membership for financial ability or financial reasons, you can." All right. Same response that Bishop John gave when someone asked him about belonging to the Masons. You shouldn't participate, but if you want to hold on to the financial advantages, you can do that. But there's no threat of overthrow anymore, so is there something inherently, the whole secret, I'm uh, trying to find a logical link now. I'm not planning on joining. There's anything. no threat to overthrow? Have you talked to yeah. President Trump lately? <laughs> We done? Yep. Been sitting here too long? chaplain of the Warwick group of the AOH uh, about his group. He says, well, they meet occasionally. <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> Thank you very much again. Thanks all.